Really Water for the World is barely two years old. Uh, you know, when I look, and you'll be hearing something about our history tonight, um, it's, it's an extraordinary journey we've been on, and, and it feels like we've been at it for a decade or more, but in fact, we've only been at it for two years, and, and the things we've been involved in are, I think, absolutely extraordinary. One of the things that you'll hear about that, um, you know, we work in a lot of countries, and you'll be hearing about some of the work we do, but one of the things that has happened to us, both planned and has happened to us, is, you know, we've been working in Asia, and in Haiti, and in Africa, and now in Central America, and our work is not just in poor countries, but as you will hear, we've often been working with the poorest of the poor, in poor countries, which has brought with us some special challenges and has offered us some special miracles as we go. So I, I just wanted to introduce you briefly to some folks who've done some extraordinary work who could tell you about their work just briefly before we get on to the main business of the program, which is into Africa. So first I wanted to introduce Ta Tamara Linder, from, who's from, from Olympia, but has worked actually gone to Haiti twice. She was trained by uh, uh, um, Del and Sue at our, our first North American training, which was at Attic Quarters at Quaker Cove Camp. And uh, she has been to Haiti now twice, working with All Hands Volunteers. Thank you, thank you David. Uh, good evening. Um, well, I had a chance to um, share my story already with two lovely ladies while, while we had dinner. And so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how I went to Haiti and what I did there. Um, I was in a program last fall quarter at Evergreen State College called Caribbean Cultural Crossings. And the following quarter, um, I was in a follow-up program to that, um, which was called Caribbean Tourism, a critical analysis. My, my professor would, would emphasize the uh, subtitle of the program because it wasn't just about uh, well, what it would sound like, Caribbean tourism, let's go lay on the beach. Um, and so from, from the get-go, when I was in the program, I told my professor, Tom Moldorf, that I was interested in going to Haiti. And built into the program was a three-week travel period um, during the second quarter, winter quarter. And he was very supportive, but he also warned me that Evergreen wouldn't be jumping up and down at the prospect of me going to Haiti. Um, and so I was able to convince the administration to let me go, and there was a few of us who traveled um, during that three-week period. So my first time in Haiti was um, the first three weeks of February of last year. And um, I went, I had found an organization just before I left, happily, because it helped to convince Evergreen to let me go. Um, I found an organization called All Hands Volunteers, and they are a U.S.-based uh, disaster relief organization uh, who has now responded to about 30-some disasters around the world, including in the U.S. And their program in Haiti has been running now for two years. It's based in the city of Leogan, which that picture, I believe, is of the hillside in Port-au-Prince. Um, um, but Leogan is about 25 kilometers to the west of Port-au-Prince. Um, it's a city of about, depending on how they count, it's somewhere around 150 or 200,000 inhabitants. And they lost a great number of people um, in the earthquake. It was the epicenter of the earthquake, or near the epicenter as the um, picture shows. Um, 80 to 90 percent of the structures were, were damaged or destroyed in the earthquake. And um, as, as some of you probably already know, Haiti is counted among the least wealthy or the poorest, I should say, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And so even before the earthquake, Haiti had a lot, of, a lot of problems, a lot of poverty, a lot of lack of infrastructure. And um, this, this program that All Hands started was to respond to the needs of the people after the earthquake. And so they had a rubble removal program, a school building program, <coughs> as well as a biosand water filter program. And so I was able to work in uh, all three areas. And when I was there in February, they had four molds and they were making four filters a day. And when I went back this fall for two months, um, they had now gotten another four filters. They had eight filters and were making 
uh, eight filters per day. And they had a team of Haitian, local Haitian volunteers and employees. Um, when I got there, there were four employees, four, four uh, full-time employees running uh, the production. They, they had two separate sides of the program. The production team who worked on the base where we lived and built the filters. And then they have a uh, field team, they call it, who go out, do the assessments um, in communities, and do the installation process, which is very important because that's where the, the, the people who are buying the filter will learn how, how it works and how they need to take care of it and the proper um, hygiene uh, guidelines they need to follow so that they don't recontaminate their water. And at the point just before I left, they were able to hire at least another eight uh, people who had been volunteers and have actual uh, jobs for more people. And so um, the program that part of the program that receives international volunteers has now com been, been completed at the end of December. They still are on the ground, though, uh, continuing with the, the biosand water filter project and a few other things. And so now they have expanded to 16 filters per day. And they have uh, uh, gotten a sand washing machine, which any of you have any experience building filters, you know that washing, washing and sifting the sand is a, is a high labor uh, part of the, the BSF process. And so there's another organization that works in Haiti and BSF called Clean Water for Haiti, and they had sold us their old uh, sand washing machine, which completely, you know, will change the production process. And so they're building a small factory. Um, they've looked at an example from uh, from Zambia in Africa, where they have a BSF factory. And um, I left when they were just starting that process, so I haven't seen it completed. Um, so if anybody has any questions for me about Haiti, I'd be happy to ask them. But just in general, I'd like to say it's a wonderful country. Don't be scared away by what you hear in the media because the people are wonderfully welcoming and friendly and um, we get skewed information from what we hear in the media. Um, yes. So Tamara, yeah. Tamara told me that um, we at, a, at one of our board meetings that uh, you can always tell where you will find friendly water for the world working. There will be a State Department travel advisory. <laughs> in fact, virtually every country in which we work has a State Department travel advisory. Um, it's sort of the nature of the beast, I think. And uh, do you have anything you want to show uh, me? Well, uh, these most of these pictures are from my first trip in February. Um, the here here is uh, the sort of final process of preparing the filters for going out, which is painting them. Um, you can see. Actually, in that picture, you see one international volunteer, Meg, who actually turned out to be, she had just gotten there when I got, before I left in February, and she stayed through the whole year. So she was like the, one of the longest running volunteers, um, and two of the local women who, are, um, who were working in the program at that time. And uh, you can see the very edge is, uh, it was a, a large um, half dome tent, or I'm not sure what you would call it that is directly behind the base where we lived, which happened to be an unfinished nightclub where we had our bunks and our kitchen and so on. And um, behind you see a, a white um, tent warehouse that says WFP for World Food Program. The, this, this area, all hands had, uh, along with some other organizations, turned this area behind the base into a uh, staging area for a number of different NGOs to work and have um, Prefab sites, for example, Habitat for Humanity was there building houses on uh, prefab, prefabbing them in this area and had storage for other other places. But um, the, there are some pictures here about the production process. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, we have somebody in the, in the room tonight that I actually consider a hero. I see Doug Mackey. Back there, Doug. Do you want to speak? Which I just said a few minutes. Doug, um, Doug went to Afghanistan, uh, sponsored by Friendly Water for the World and some other organizations. Um, 
not only just did he go to Afghanistan, he went to a part of Afghanistan where virtually not many aid organizations go to a place called Bamiyan to work with some other heroes of mine, the African, African, uh, the Af Afghan uh, P uh, Youth Peace Volunteers. This is a group of, you could think of them as kids, but they're, they're youth, ages 14 to about 23, who basically, they're essentially followers of Gandhi in Afghanistan. And they're also members of a minor, most of them members of a minority group, the Hazari, um, in, yeah, in, in Afghanistan. And uh, Doug had the most extraordinary adventure there. You would like to say a few words? Thank you, David. Uh, as uh, all of you know, uh, the situation in Afghanistan is, uh, continues uh, to deteriorate. Uh, even even now. Um, David mentioned the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. Um, a little over two years ago, we met this group through the internet. They had put short videos together, and I encourage you, if you have a chance, to go to OurJourneyToSmile.com, and <clears throat> you can see the three-minute, two-minute videos that they put together about their pursuit of peace along the path of truth and love. As uh, their example is not only uh, Gandhi, but uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Mother Teresa, uh, a wide range of people from different walks of life and different, uh, different religions. So <clears throat> we met this group and were able to hook them up with other young people around the world. They've spoken with folks from South Sudan recently and from, uh, oh my, uh, South Africa and Rwanda uh, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, and of course Sweden and Denmark and England and lots of places in the United States and Canada and, um, and Iraq and Palestine, Israel and uh, Syria. So they're reaching out to everyone to talk to them about um, the possibility of peace when we were speaking with them, uh, we heard about one of the mothers said, you know, on my list of things that I wish for, second on the list is clean water. And so, aha, light bulb went off. I had just completed uh, the first training that, that was done, that David mentioned. And uh, so we were able to take that <clears throat> training over with us, and we partnered with another <clears throat> one of these groups that does this kind of work around the world. Uh, it's a Danish group, and they've um, learned how to make these biosand water filters from a Canadian group. Yeah, Center for Water and Sanitation Technology. C-A-W-S-T, out of uh, Calgary. And so anyhow, this partnership made it possible for us to have a trainer there that spoke the language in Afghanistan. And we, <clears throat> the Youth Peace Volunteers found a village where the only water that they had was coming from a, a, a river that was polluted. So virtually everyone in that community, 150 people, were, were having digestive problems. Uh, and several were sick at the time that we were there. And uh, so because of Friendly Water for the World, we were able to bring two filter uh, molds uh, to this community. And um, they have since completed the work on another water system, and they have, um, by agreement, they have passed now the molds on to another community to be used. And so the work that uh, Friendly Water is doing in Afghanistan will continue to move from community to community uh, to help uh, people have, have cleaner water. So thank you. Thank you. I think it's worth noting that from the United Nations that the data shows that more people die in Afghanistan from diseases related to, to water than from all causes of war and violence. So that's just a sobering thought. Now, when I got here today, I was actually coming from another dinner. Um, there, believe it or not, there is a semi-friendly water event going on in Kent, even as we speak. Um, the South Sudan Community Restoration Project came to us uh, last year and they said, 
We, which included many of the former lost boys of Sudan who are now found and live among us and are American citizens, wanted to go back and bring something back to the people of South Sudan. And the situation there, it's the newest country on earth, nine million people, and people tell me there's not a drop of clean water in the entire country. And there are hundreds of thousands of refugees, many of course came to the US, but all over Africa, and they are wanting to return. But one of the problems with returning refugees, they will often be in camps run by the United Nations and others, who will bring them purified water, and so they'll have had clean water in the camps, but when they return home, the only sources of water are ridden with typhoid, cholera, cryptosporidium, giardia, and so the folks at Kent Lutheran Church who were mounting this project came to Friendly Water for the World and said, can you train us? And they were part of our training last summer. And then they had an additional training in building composting latrines for, I believe, 26,000 refugees coming back. And they're headed off in two weeks to first to Ethiopia, their staging area, and then to the eastern portions of South Sudan, where they're hoping to build at least 50 biosand water filters, teach people how to make them, build composting latrines, and make it possible for people to get a new start in their old land. Um, I, I actually, rather than having him speak, I just want Bob Benassi, who's gonna be on this trip, to please stand. I know he's also associated with Olympic View Friends Church, and he's at it over 14 days, Bob? Yeah, I'll be there about three weeks. Right, and he'll be there about three weeks, but he leaves, and so he goes with our thoughts and prayers. The, uh, the folks from um, uh, the project also involved us in their shoe project, and we, uh, Friendly Water for the World is responsible for having collected 3,500 pounds of shoes, which were then sold, and uh, the money used to support the trip. So thank you, Bob, and we give you our best wishes for, for uh, your trip. I also want to acknowledge two other people, Wayne, Robin, in the back over there. These folks have started, were trained, uh, Robin at least was on our training last summer, and they've started something called the Northwest Biosand Institute. We think of the work as being in the third world. Believe it or not, there are parts of western Washington where people don't have access to clean water. They are contaminated wells in rural parts of Thurston County, I think of Pierce County as well as well. People cannot afford to get connected up to the municipal water lines or the municipal water lines just don't get out that far and the water is impure. And so Wayne and Robin are heading up a project whereby they're helping uh, uh, install, build and install biosand water filters in places where people right here in western Washington are not able to get clean drinking water otherwise. So thank you Robin and Wayne. Delana. Is that the kids? Yeah. All right. Okay. Go to it. What's my topic? Give me a topic. Hi, I'm Delana Halliday, and I'm Del and Sue's daughter. So, and I'm actually not standing up here to talk about them. Uh, <laughs> I know. Who would have thought? I get to do that, but later. Okay. All right. So, but um, I, in the real world, I teach fourth grade, and one of the um, one of the really cool things that happened to me this year is I got selected to pilot an arts enviro challenger program for the city of Tacoma. And um, this wonderful artist, uh, Meredith Essex, came in and taught my students all about environmental issues and said, and there are things you can do. And there are kids who are doing things and started handing out these papers about kids who are doing things. And they were, they're called the eco heroes. So they're nationally recognized heroes. And I said, wait a sec, let me see those. One of them was Avalon. Avalon Thiessen. Yeah, Avalon Thiessen, who has worked with us. And in there it listed, she did all these activities to raise money for Friendly Waters for the World. And she designed our logo. Yeah. 10 so, years old. Yeah, it's amazing. And so um, <laughs> at the next recess, I see three of my boys in the office. And my first thought is, oh, who are they tattling on now? <laughs> and my principal calls me in and says, so, I had just had three boys in here, mm -hmm. and uh, they would like to know how they can raise money for water for Africa. 
I'm like, really? Um, Jen, I did not put them up to this. <laughs> like, I know it's my parents' project, and I talked about what a great thing Avalon was doing, but I, I didn't put them up for this. And she said, it's just fine, we're gonna make it happen. So it looks like we're gonna have a big Earth Day celebration, and part of it will be fundraising for Friendly Waters for the World. Yeah. And you'll be Skyping with Avalon. Right, and in two weeks, we'll be Skyping with Avalon. So it's not to get to interview this eco hero and hear about her frogs. Avalon is in Tampa, Florida. Oh yeah, that's an important detail, yeah. She's clear out there in Florida. So it's great to have this Florida, um, Northwest connection that we can grow with. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dylan. Next, I want to call on another one of my heroes. Suzanne Livingston, I know I'm going to talk about how I met the Livingstons a little bit later. But Suzanne has been on all the, the trips. She's been a, uh, a leveling presence, I think would be the way I would like to put it. Well, I worked with her in Kenya, where we were uh, training folks at Lugulu Hospital in, in western Kenya. Um, she's much of the glue that holds us together, and she has great stories to tell, and so I'm just going to leave it to her. Suzanne, are you ready? Yep. I'm Del. I'm Del, okay. Hello. I have a friend that says, well, every adventure is either fun or makes a good story. So I've been thinking about stories. And, um, you know, every, every story starts someplace, but sometimes it's hard to figure out where they start. And so I decided to start this little story. I'd like to tell you, some of you know that for oh, over a dozen years, we went to Mexico during spring break in a thing called Getaway Giveaway. And we were always a little negligent about um, <laughs> getting a place to stay in Sacramento. And so uh, we were supposed to write the, church, uh, the Citrus Heights Friends Church like two weeks early and, and have all this stuff. And, and always a week before, we were calling them up and saying, oh, we need to come down. And, and they would say, OK, we'll have someone here to unlock the door. So. Um, one time, the, we were on our way home and we stopped in Salem, Oregon. We pulled off at the Market Street exit and um, we pulled into a gas station and we all got gas, I mean they, the car got gas and we went to the bathroom and, <laughs> and we, one of the other adults said, does Del know someone here? He's talking to someone. I said, he doesn't know anybody here. <laughs> so Dill comes out and he gets in the van and he takes off and he said, you know, I was talking to the secretary of Citrus Heights French Church who was on her way home from Alaska. And so here we were from Washington coming back from Mexico meeting this lady that recognized Dill's voice she had never seen him before. Just talked to him on the phone. And I, I just thought about that, and, and I thought, well, why did that happen? It's just a piece of random weirdness. But what I really decided is that it was God saying, there are more things planned in your life than you ever imagined. And sometimes I let you, to, I let you see how things are planned. Just be confident that no matter what you do, I have good things planned for you. Um, yeah, you'll probably wonder why in the world we uh, take off and, and uh, leave our grandkids and go off to Africa. But um, once you get exposed to what's going on, it's uh, pretty, pretty hard to leave it alone. You just have to get back and continue your work. Um, it kind of started as a, a big bang uh, in that uh, it started basically uh, by the chance that uh, we had to go, we had a fellow in uh, Q 
Kenya that would make the steel molds for us. But uh, we really didn't have a project until uh, Patrick Nugent came to this church, who was a, the, uh, uh, the principal of the Friends Theological, uh, Theological College. And he says, well, why don't you start at my school? So we did that. But, um, and it turned out really well. And uh, what their problem was, was um, uh, typhoid, cholera, and, dis and diarrhea, dysentery. It was a big issue in their, uh, they had 60 some students, and it just kept going on and on. So there was absenteeism was very high. So uh, we proceeded to get them a filter, and, uh, but um, Delana and Mike had gone to England and um, to a friend's, uh, what was it, World, World Conference? World Gathering of Young Friends. Yeah, okay, World Gathering of Young Friends. And um, a fellow by the name of uh, Eric Lajoti was there, and he's from Kenya, and uh, he found out that we were over there and he says, well, come to my place. We need clean water very badly. He says, we have piped water, but people are getting typhoid. And so we did that. But it was just so amazing to think that the we... Line. Can you put the picture up? Well, we live in an environment which we really don't worry about things like that much. But as it turned out, this was a, a real revelation for the Kenyans for this to all occur. In this group of people, we had about 25 that were our students, but we had five different denominations. And they told us this is the first time that five groups had ever worked together. And what a revelation that was. And uh, to, the, to this day, the majority of them are still working at this. And the, one of the, mostly the women, they're the best workers of all. And if you could see very carefully, they are wearing shirts that say Quaker coat that <laughs> Mrs. Jerry made for us. Yeah, we, we only took those because they were, they were cheap. <laughs> no, that's not true. No. We, we thought we were going to work with Quakers, but and, they and, were all proud of them. Yeah, they, but it became their uniform. And when I go back, they get out their Quaker Cove shirts to show me their uniforms are still there and uh, but the neatest part of it was one of the ladies there she says thank you Dell, for coming she says now my school fees are going to be paid and that was one of the biggest issues and whenever you're in that country people will come to you and some of them rather sheepy say you know I've got three kids and I can't pay for school fees and it was just so neat to be able that this, some of these people can pay their school fees out of the work that they do from their Biosound Water Filter Project. So we have people coming together from Africa, from the United States, to England, and then back to Africa. So that was an interesting connection. Yeah. And um, so anyway, this, this project, Eric Lajoti is our guy in in Kenya and uh, throughout our area. He covers down to Burundi and, and wherever we need him. He works for uh, the government and uh, when you work for the Kenyan government there seems to be an awful lot of flexibility about when you want to go to work. <laughs> so uh, he just, but the thing is his boss likes what he's doing and uh, whenever Eric gets an assignment to go someplace, well uh, he goes and says, okay, go. <laughs> so he, he goes and does that, and uh, he pretty well keeps things under control for us. The next story I want to talk to you about is also from our first training, and there was Dr. Jonathan Hibbs and his two sons, and they do um, medical work in Honduras, and so Dr. Jonathan called us up and said, I think I really, really want you to go to Honduras. Uh, and so we said, okay, well, anyway. So when we got back from Kenya this time, we figured out a time to go to Honduras. And so we were there three weeks and 
we did two separate projects and this is um, one of the houses we were staying that's okay go ahead this is one of the houses we were staying at and this was the first group that we had training and they um, made actually the man um, made the, the steel mold and then we had the training in his house and we were able to install a filter um, in his kitchen so they were really excited about that and we had two or three more made that were just curing and waiting okay so here we are installing it in his kitchen and it started to rain and it rained for days just like here except it was heavier rain and it rained and rained and rained so you can see everyone's kind of wet and muddy but anyway we're getting the biosan water filter put in his kitchen the um, next place we went was up at um, the uh, Alta Gracias, and it was their um, church camp where we had the training. And Del and um, Laura worked with a, a group of um, young men, and they did um, the training and made filters. And so we installed a filter at the caretaker's house. And the next week, all of the pastors from Honduras, the Quaker pastors from Honduras, were at the camp. And they all went down to see his water filter. So now every single church in Honduras, Friends Church, wants to have a biosign water filter project. And one of the little pluses to this whole trip was that Paul Ambleton, who is a, a chief for the South Pierce County Fire and Rescue. Um, he spends most of his free time in Guatemala. And so he's in real good contact with uh, uh, the Rotary and with church groups. And uh, so uh, he's, there are two fellows that he brought with him to our training in, uh, uh, in Honduras. And uh, so we've opened a whole new field in Honduras, and it's just really exciting. And uh, pardon me, Guatemala. And uh, Guatemala is going to be a big project, and it's uh, really exciting. It's kind of fun. Honduras, uh, Honduras has great roads. <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to doing projects there as opposed to uh, Kenya, who has terrible roads. But Honduras, still over 40,000 children. Um, a year die from waterborne illnesses. So they're, and many houses have piped water, but it's dirty piped water. So the, these, uh, the kids that we're working with, they're all kids, um, <laughs> there was a doctor up at the camp and he was reciting to these students how many people die in, in, in Honduras every year. And, um, we talked about these filters, about the life-saving ability of clean water, and without a hesitation, let's do it. Let's fix it. So we've talked about our first project and a project we just did, and now Dell's going to share a little bit about a project that's coming together for our next trip. Um, this is kind of a um, as the door opens thing and that um, uh, we'll be going to Zimbabwe which of course if you listen to the news isn't the best uh, resort place to go to Safe travel advisor. <laughs> yeah no Peace Corps there and uh, uh, as a matter of fact in Honduras and Guatemala the Peace Corps was uh, evacuated while we were in in those countries so uh, give you an idea I guess uh, we, hit the rough side of the, of the tracks. And uh, so uh, there was a, a fellow um, in Portland, uh, met another guy that had just graduated from uh, George Fox University. And uh, he has a master's now, and he's, going, he's from Zimbabwe, and he has gone back to Zimbabwe. And he has a church, but he is doing an awful lot of uh, uh, relief work in villages around the whole area that he lives in. And um, this fellow in Oregon, uh, David Winterhauer, uh, 
happened to be going to Mazaban. He goes to the same church that Suzanne and I do, and uh, and mentioned about this whole water thing uh, to the pastor, Fred Collum. And Fred says, well, when you get back, get back and call Suzanne and Dell. They work in Africa. They'll, they'll work things out for you. So, uh, so uh, every, the uh, group in Oregon have been sending money to the organization in Zimbabwe. And so, uh, and they're uh, uh, sent money up for this project. And so uh, this is going to be uh, uh, another, another step, another country that, to deal with. We, uh, it's kind of like the blind leading the blind because I've never been there, so it's gonna be quite an experience. But one of the greatest experiences of all is that we will land at uh, Victoria Falls, which has been one of those things that I wanted to see besides seeing it in National Geographic. So. And then we're going 300 kilometers away from a city. So I'm not exactly sure. Another, I don't know. I, I hope we have a, 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 a car to go all that way <laughs> and not having to go on donkey or something. <laughs> so we've had people attending George Fox University, talking to people in Portland um, who know people in Matsalan that know us. Strange, isn't it? So. As Del mentioned, almost got the quote, there's an old Quaker saying, as way opens, and that's sort of what this whole thing is about, just as the way opens, then we um, feel commanded almost to um, walk in it. Thank you. Well, that was something. Now I want to tell you about how a friendly water happened, and uh, from, from where I sit. And uh, it was sort of an interesting tale it's about five years ago, a little over five years ago, and Dell had been trained to do these biosand filter things, but he hadn't actually done them yet. He wanted to go to Kenya. Yeah, I've done, 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 done one. He wanted to go to Kenya. Yeah, done, he hadn't been able to raise enough funds. And an attender at this church, Olympic View Friends Church, a man named Jack Zeiger, had actually joined our friends meeting in Olympia. And I happened to uh, clerk our right sharing of world resources group down in Olympia. And uh, Dell um, was encouraged to cross the cultural divide uh, to come see me um, in Olympia. Now, I have to tell you, this is the way I saw it. I never worked on it. I, I have 35 years of experience of working with the poorest of the poor in South India, where I've been doing land reform. And I've watched many people die of bad water. And my wife and I, my wife's here, both had hepatitis um, A from bad water in 1981. I didn't have it particularly badly. She did. We had many hospital adventures that we, I won't tell you about now. But, but Del comes to me, came down to see me, and he didn't say it in exactly these way, this way. But essentially, I saw this man before me and he said, essentially, I'm here because I want to save the world one glass of water at a time. I actually don't even remember him talking to me much about biosand water filters. I certainly did not understand at that point how they worked. And I certainly didn't understand what difference it would make in my life, his, or now the lives of thousands and thousands of people. He just came to me and said, essentially, he didn't say it in these worlds, I want to save the world one glass of water at a time. And when somebody comes to you and says that, the thing to do is to say, okay, what do you need? <laughs> and he said to me, $1,500. I said, well, let's save the world at $1,500. Well, going through my head, save the world for $1,500, that should be easy enough. And so I Xeroxed up a bunch of pages of the International Food Cookbook, all the recipes I could find from Africa, and I handed it out to all the members of my meeting and said, here, cook this. And said, don't worry what it tastes like. None of us knows what it's supposed to taste like. <laughs> and so we had a Quaker potluck and raised him his $1,500 and sent him on his way. And he came back, and we worked on, I'm, I'm doing the short version of the story, we worked on a bunch of projects together. 
And he, every once in a while he would say to me, isn't it time to make a formal organization? And I kept on saying, we'll know when it's time. We'll know when it's time. Well, in late 2009, Dell comes to me, having just come back from India, working with the people with whom I work, and he says, the organization of, of Northwest Yearly Meeting, the churches, do a Thanksgiving appeal. And they decided to give the money to me to do a water project someplace. So he said to me something like, well, where should we do it? And I looked him in the eye, and I said, Burundi. And he said, why Burundi? I'm not sure if you knew where it was. Well, I, I think you did. Okay, but I barely knew where it was. I had postage stamps yeah. from when I was a kid. <laughs> Burundi, why Burundi? I said, because it's the poorest country in Africa. It's got really bad water. Lots of people are dying there, and we have friends. My meeting had started a project, a, a little goat project, in, um, with people in Mutaho, a, re a hill town which had been a center of the Burundi genocide in 1993. It had been a town of 150,000 people. Every building had been destroyed. And through a whole series of experiences that I'm not even going to begin to tell you, um, I got involved in this project with these 54 widows and all their children, and that pr prompted me to bring a goat into meeting on Sunday. And we brought a goat into meeting to raise money for 27 goats, for 54 widows. Share, each goat shared between a Tutsi and a Hutu woman, a woman the, the two groups that were, had been warring. They had to name the goat together, care for the goat. And when the goat had a kid, they would have a ceremony and one would take the kid off. And then the villagers decided to do, the women decided to do something interesting. When they had more goats, by the way, they don't eat the goats and they don't use the milk. They needed the manure for their bean plant. These people are desperately poor. We're talking about an average income of $100 a year. And they took the extra goats and they started the process in the next village. And then the next village. And then there were 12 villages. And today, the project has been taken over by the Goldman Sachs Social Entrepreneurship Fund to go to hundreds of villages. And it started from the one goat that we brought to the friends' meeting. So anyway, as I said, Burundi, we have those widows there, and they desperately need clean water. Quick facts about Burundi. The United Nations says that 166 out of every 1,000 children under the age of 5 die before the age of 5, 80% of them because of waterborne diseases. But that's for the whole country. When you go up to Mutaho, it's probably closer to three to 350 children every thousand that are born. Which tells you that every family has a dead child. So, Dell, having never been to Burundi, certainly never been to Mutaho, I only knew where it was on a map, and the letters I would get from Pastor Sarah there, telling me about what was happening with the goats. Go, uh, we, anyway, we thought, he, at the end of the conversation was, Dell, how much money do you think you're going to raise? And he said to me, 5000 yeah. And I said, Dell, that's just not going to be enough, but I guess I'll have to go raise the rest. Well, I didn't because there's a fourth grader than I that did it for me, and $32,000 came in. He got, Suzanne and Dell go up to Mutao, Burundi, to work with the widows and other folks, and train these folks. And they began to build filters. And then, the folks there, the African Great Lakes Initiative folks who were working on peace initiatives there, even after the genocide in 1993, the militias in Burundi kept fighting. Child soldiers, 14 years old, 15 years old, 16 years old, they're now all grown up, or they're in their late 20s and early 30s. The militias have supposedly made peace, but these folks have no way to go. They have no homes. Everyone's afraid of them. All they know how to do is shoot guns. With the help of the widows and another small grant, they trained 
these former militia people, from each militia coming together into one cooperative group to build biosand water filters in Mutaho. And now, so now mind you, it started in April 2010. We're talking about a 20 month period. And I want to begin to show you what's happening. This is called the Mutaho Project. Two months ago, the Mutaho Project people contacted us and they said, we have formed a cooperative. We've built more than 100 filters. They've made major differences in people's lives. The people want to buy them. They don't want us to donate them. They don't want it. They don't want donation. They don't want a handout. They want to buy them. But you know, on, on $100 of income a year, they don't have a lot of money. Nonetheless, people are willing to pay. Now, this is a rural area with very poor roads. So filters cost, with the labor there, cost about $54 a piece. The people are willing to, to raise $27 each to put filters in their homes. If we will raise the other half. And so the Mutaho project has now been born. And I want to introduce you to some of the people who are asking us to open our checkbooks or use our little pieces of plastic. Thank you. Um, to make it possible to end the scourge of waterborne diseases in Mutaho. So Ginny, you start. I'm going to tell you about each of these people. This is Beatrice Ketamutima. She's a 49-year-old widow who lives in the internally displaced people's camp her family drinks water from the public taps, but it's often very dirty, especially during the rainy seasons. She says filters will help us live a healthy life. Now her family often suffers from worms, coughs, and malaria, either caused by or exacerbated by unclean water. They spend a lot of money going to the, going to the hospital. Her 14-year-old daughter, Divine, and I'm not going to get that right, Kayanga, says, that she often misses classes because she's sick. Recently, they went to the hospital to look for deworming medication. Next one, please. Next one. Balthazar Dirishikwaka is a 48-year-old pastor with six children. He and other community members paid money for the public tap to be built in their community, but now he feels they have waited too long. At the moment, his wife or children bring water from the stream to a friend's house to filter it, but it is difficult to make the trip every day. Balthazar is happy to pay for a filter over six installments. He says, it is more expensive to bring my children to the hospital when they get sick than to buy a filter. This is Illuminae Sabashumiki. As a 40-year-old, 49-year-old widow and a mother of three children, when they have money, they pay the small fee to collect water from a public tap. But they don't have enough. Their water comes from the river. Lumine says, it gets us sick, but we have no option. She often sees dirt and worms in the water they drink. She says, even today I am sick. I have a terrible cough and diarrhea. Maybe it's due to the dirty water. A friend told her about the filters, and even though it will be difficult to find the money, she says, I will cultivate other people's land for money. I really need a filter. I'll work for it. I'm very determined. She would rather work and pay for a filter than to continue to get sick and lose out on opportunities to work. If I don't go to work, I don't eat because I have no land. That having a filter will be a dream come true. Next, please. Leopold Dirichiraka and um, Haskasi Inungweta, they live in the internally displaced people's camp in Mutao. There are many refugees who live in camps in the area. Leopold became interested in the filters when he went to a friend's house and tasted their filtered water. Following the installation of public taps in Mutao, Leopold was one of the people asked to sensitize the community about taking care of their sources of water and maintaining the public taps. He says, now I want to serve as an example by buying a filter. Next one. 
This is Marcel Berzingo. He's 46 years old and has five children. He says that water sanitation is a big problem here. We drink tap water and it's not clean at all. One day I was drinking water and had a worm in my mouth. Especially now during the rainy season, water gets very bad, very dirty. We need a filter now more than ever. His children get sick with diarrhea and coughing and have trouble performing well in class. Marcel is especially concerned that when the exam season is during the rainy seasons, which makes it difficult for children to achieve good results. A water filter would help his children stay focused in school and avoid illness during exams, ultimately giving them the skills to work towards a more hopeful future. Next one, please. Rachel Wakana is a 64-year-old widow with eight children. She understands the importance of treating water. In the past, her family was often sick, but they heard on the radio that they should boil the water, and after they followed the advice, they had been healthier. Ra Rachel heard about the filters from a neighbor. She goes there to filter her water and has seen that it improves the water and also gives it a good taste. But she says, I am getting old. I cannot always walk the distance to filter the water. She says she will use the profit from her coffee crop to buy a filter for her own home. Is a 33-year-old teacher who lives in an internal, in in internally displaced people's camp with his younger brothers and sisters. There is a filter in the school where he works and says, now I want to drink clean water at home with my family. He is planning to pool his savings with some of his neighbors so that they can buy a filter together. He hopes that the water will improve the health of the neighborhood, but also relationships. People will come here and, will, and meet, and then they will come to filter their water here. Sekundi Bukuru is a mother of one. She lives with five family members and her husband, who is a secondary school teacher. She would love to have a filter in her house, because she does not trust that the water they collect from the public tap is clean. At home, they often suffer from diarrhea and malaria. After church, they always go to drink water from the water filter at Pastor Sarah's house. Pastor Sarah was the one with the goat project. And found that it tasted good. She hopes that clean water will make them healthier. Vincent, Ahunga, and Beatrice, Kubawani. Kubawani. Both are teachers and share their house with eight people. Their children are often sick, mainly because of dirty water. Vincent says, we have a filter in our school now and we get water, and the water we get there is clean and tastes better than what we drink at home. We collect water from the public tap, but it's not always clean, especially during the rainy seasons, when it often smells like clay and has sand in it. The children have to go to hospital every three months so that they, because of the worms. And now I bring you to the exciting one. Del, Suzanne, these people are you. <laughs> these pe now I want to tell you about Pi. Pi is an ex-combatant. I don't think you were ever in a militia. But Pi was an ex-combatant. Mind you, all the people we've talked to suffer from some form of tra traumatic stress. Almost all of them have lost family members in the genocide. Almost all of them feared militias coming through. Virtually every one of those families lost at least one family member from bad water. But this is Pai Mubezenuekamwe. He's an ex-combatant in Mutaho. He's one of the people trained in biosand filter construction. He is one of the most dedicated members of the co-op, coming to construct filters several times a week and volunteering his motorcycle for the transportation and installation of filters. When speaking of his time as an ex-combatant, he says, I want to use the same energy to help people live a healthy life by making water filters. He and his wife, Jacqueline, have a filter at home, and Pi says, we have no doubt now when we're drinking water. None of my children now miss school because they suffer from diarrhea. Jacqueline is seven months pregnant. 
With her previous pregnancies, she was frequently sick, but with the one she now is now pregnant with, she has never fallen ill. Their neighbors also know that they can come filter water at Pi and Jacqueline's house. That's not the whole story. I also have a proposal sitting in my email on my desk, and we're looking at it carefully now. These same people now want to take the project and go upscale and build a national center for reconciliation and clean water. They want to hold their workshops, their healing and rebuilding our community's workshops to deal with the trauma that has come from 40 years of war and the 1993 genocide. And when after they have worked with people with their trauma, they want to tr train them in community sanitation and hygiene and start five more cooperatives to go out and build biosand water filters all over Burundi. Eight days. Eight days for these two people. Eight days. It cost. It costs us fifty dollars a day to keep these people on the road. That's it. They're not living high on the hog. I've been with them in Kenya. <laughs> we Kenyans. <laughs> right. We are now beginning to work on projects in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. I know you're going to be in Congo for two weeks. The Burundi project, the first part of the project, this part to support the participants has already been adopted by our board. We're going to be collecting $50 per filter. 27 of them is going to go to the co-op and 23 essentially is going to be to put Dell and Sue on the road. And we're training other people, as you see, to be on the road. Doug, Tamara, myself in India. We're going to, I keep on telling people as we prepare things at the board, in five years, our organization is going, with your help, is going to be very large. Clean water is the number one issue in the world today. Half the world's hospital beds are filled with people with waterborne illnesses. And besides the deaths of children that I spoke to, there's something called um, uh, parasitic stress. Scientists have now come to know that because of parasites, almost all from bad water, that children experiences between the age of one and five impacts their entire intellectual development for the next 40 to 60 years of their life. If you were thinking of putting money into a school, that's fine, but you've got to do something for those kids before they get to school to prevent basically the energy that would have gone to brain development is going to fight off parasites in their system. We need your help. We need to help Dell and Sue save the world one glass of water at a time. Thank you.